Every day, the world has more people, more economic growth, and so more demands for energy. Conventional energy sources, such as oil and gas, will struggle to keep up while also respecting today's social and environmental concerns, not least of which climate change. If managed responsibly, biofuels could help. Some even say they're the only commercially available solution to cutting carbon out of transport fuels today. But over recent years, there has been much criticism of biofuels. One of the many downsides is land conversion, such as turning forest into farmland, or draining wetlands to increase agricultural production, including for biofuels. This can release greenhouse gases and harm nature and people. One solution might be to use existing farmland instead. But that just creates a knock-on effect. Whatever people were doing or growing on that land will have to move somewhere else if we take their land away to grow biofuels. This is what we call indirect land use change, or ILUC. Imagine a company, BBB, Better Business and Biofuels. Yes, sir. It has found a perfect plot of land somewhere in Africa on which to grow plants for biofuels. The price is right? But for now, local farmers are using this land to graze cattle and grow crops. So let's think this through. Local demand for cattle will not disappear when the grazing land disappears. The farmers will move on somewhere else to graze or grow their food. If that somewhere else is unused forest or grassland, the displaced farmers will be encroaching on an area that could be important for biodiversity and a living carbon sink. Once the cutting, burning and grazing begin, how many animals and plants will remain? How much CO2 will be released into the atmosphere as the lot goes up in smoke? If you do the sums and compare the amount of CO2 emissions that were not emitted thanks to BBB's biofuels, then add on the indirect emissions, you'll find that in some cases, biofuels can even contribute more greenhouse gases than fossil fuels do. The EU and US governments are considering how to deal with this problem linked to ILUC as part of their policy to reduce greenhouse gas emissions in the transport sector. Three main problems have emerged so far. One, the US and EU markets are big, but not by any means the only markets for biofuels. Two, it is difficult to apportion ILUC to a specific feedstock, as plants are used for many things besides biofuels. And three, a lot of time and money is and will be spent trying to prove whether and exactly how much ILUC has or has not occurred. One approach could be preventing ILUC in the first place. Okay, but how? Instead of going somewhere else to raise the cattle or grow food, we could, for example, increase the efficiency of the land we already have. That way we can do both on the same plot of land and avoid ILUC. Sounds promising, but again, isn't it too good to be true? Actually, no. We can increase production by improving efficiency all along the supply chain. And there's plenty of room for improvement. Just to take a recent example, the Hindustani Times of India recently estimated the amount of cereal crops lost to corruption and inadequate storage at 11 billion tons. That's nearly 20% of the country's entire stock. Why look for more land when such tremendous waste could and should be stopped first? Here's a diagram to help visualize how increasing efficiency, as one example, can help decrease ILUC. On the left, you have the total increase in the demand for land, whether for food or biofuels, that could occur if ILUC went unchecked. As you shift to the right, you'll see that gains in efficiency, such as better use of fertilizers, eco-farming techniques, and optimized land use, eat into that block, so that the more efficient things get, the less risk of provoking ILUC. The challenge is that these mitigation measures are difficult to implement. 
making degraded land productive may take extra upfront investments of time and money. Getting higher yields out of smallholder production systems requires people to work with farmers to introduce different farming practices. Getting more product to market means investing in transport and storage systems in places where it is difficult to get that investment to happen and to maintain it. Ooh. Policymakers are looking at what can be done with ILAC risks from biofuels. The emerging policy frameworks should enable producers to overcome the barriers to ILUC mitigation and should ensure ILUC risks are effectively managed. Hey! Yeah, Are. Success factors for determining whether ILUC policy is going to deliver effective mitigation include Effective and meaningful. Will the policy result in ILUC mitigation happening on the ground? <coughs> Measurable and verifiable. Does the policy enable ILUC mitigation to be measured and verified? <coughs> Pathway neutral, performance based, is the policy framed around performance, in other words, a greenhouse gas and energy balance within the bounds of other sustainability aspects, in order to drive innovation in all biofuels towards desired policy objectives. Again. Feasible. Does the policy enable solutions which are technically feasible? Does the policy give ILUC mitigation a value which can be captured by those who bear the costs of the mitigation measure? Is it politically feasible? <laughs> Not again. Based on best available science, is it based on what we know within reason? Flexible and adaptive. Does the policy allow for change based on evidence and experience? <coughs> Trigger positive change. Does the policy promote ILUC mitigation that results in improved outcomes for the environment and people? <coughs> Resilience. Does the policy promote ILUC mitigation that contributes to the resilience of human and ecological systems? That's enough. Hasta la vista, baby. So if we want to save biodiversity, time and money, all the while cutting greenhouse gas emissions, we need to get together and work out how best to prevent ILUC and then make sure biofuel policies press farmers and producers to take the necessary measures to prevent ILUC.